All right, everybody. On today's episode of Shop Time, or today's Shop Time episode, whichever way you want to feel, you want to be feel dyslexic, that's fine. My hat fell down on the floor. We're going to talk about servo motors. That's a little shoppy. It's got a little hint of shop to it. We, uh, we, use, we use servo motors on all of our equipment that we use, this uh, strapping equipment. Uh, that's how it, servo motors are highly accurate whenever it comes to measurements and how long you want a motor to run, how fast you want it to run. Uh, there's some drink. So we'll look at some of those, look at the, the servo motors that we use. Um, a servo motor is a highly efficient motor. It's, it's, it's very, very efficient. Um, it's not as efficient as a DC motor, but a DC motor is a lot harder to control. Well, it's not harder to control. You just need a lot of different stuff. A servo motor, our servo motors that we use, um, are the same kind of uh, servo motors that you find in a lot of robotics. Except their servo motor is usually about that big, depending on the robot. If you got a robot that's cutting down a tree, then the servo motor is pretty doggone big. Uh, if you got a servo motor that's pulling a little belt that wants to that has to move this far, then it's, the servo motor is usually smaller. Uh, our servo motor is about this big, and all we do is we use them for positioning and uh, for counting and everything. That and that's the difference between a servo motor and a regular just OAC motor that you find out uh, in a lot of applications is the servo motors, what makes them a servo motor is on the back of them, they got what's called an encoder. Now on the encoder, it has little, different encoders have different things on them. Some of them have uh, uh, little magnetic dots on them. Uh, some of them have just a, just a, it's just a little disc, it's about this big around. And some of them have holes in them. And in that encoder assembly, you got something that's that's a pickup, and it's gonna pick up. How you doing? It's gonna pick up the number of makes and breaks in that in that disc, and it's gonna count it. And so, if you've got one that's set for every time it breaks, let me back up just a bit. Every time it makes and breaks that little encoder disc, it counts it as a pulse. So, if you set this motor to run at 300 pulses it's going to spin no matter how fast you spin it i mean some some of them have a limit and they'll let you know what the limit is like uh some of them can only run you know so fast and it'll run that fast if you run it at full speed quarter speed half speed whatever speed you run it at it's going to be able to count those pulses and whenever it gets to that pulse it's going to stop now these the drives that we use is, 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 is actually the kind of brain of the servo system. It's actually the drive. I mean, that's where you do all your programming and it, that's what actually do, controls the voltage and reads the encoder and all this stuff. Uh, but this encoder is usually on the, on the back and it's usually got a little brake on it too. So whenever it gets close, that brake to, to the end of, you know, however many pulses you choose, let's say, let's say you have 300. You have 300 pulses is what you got to set for. It'll sit there and it'll spin, and once it gets to about 270 something, you know, whatever you set it for, it goes into deceleration mode, and it'll start reduce, it start backing off the voltage and applying voltage to that brake, so that brake can actually kind of stop it and slow it down. Uh, but we'll look at some of this stuff. I'll start. I'll, I'll point it out and everything to you here in a minute whenever we get there. But uh, they're actually pretty neat, especially once you get to fully understand them, you can do all kinds of stuff with them. It's pretty neat. Okay, this is what the servo motor actually looks like. Uh, you can tell that's just the, what kind of voltage it runs off of, how many amps it's supposed to pull, 230 volts, two amps, that's what it's rated for. Now you look right here, I've got, uh, this particular gear right here is a two-stage gear and you can run two different positions off of the same gear and not have to change the gear every time one of the positions wears out uh, you can just use the same gear 
But back here is the encoder. This is for the encoder. This is this is where it actually has the the counting mechanism, and all this right here is the actual motor. But the but the encoder and the brake is on the back, and this is like I said, this is the gear, but that's the encoder. Uh, and it, it's, it, it turns this gear in two different separate places. Uh, now this encoder, like I said, is on the back here and it, it covers the entire back, that back section. It has its own special plug. And you look at all the pins inside here, that's just the power. That's nothing but power. And that's nothing but encoder. So one of them is, one of the co cables is sending, uh, power and one of the cables is is nothing but for counting encoders now this is this is the gear that actually the that gear actually turns usually when you got a gear you got two gears that are running each other uh, like this and this motor and the what we call the tree gear that's the silver tree gear right there will slide up inside that notch and mesh up to that other gear but here are the cables uh, that fit on. They just kind of fit on and tighten up. I've got Teflon tape. I don't know if you can tell, but I got Teflon tape. That white stuff is, is Teflon tape wrapped around the threads because every once in a while, especially if it's, it runs a little rough, that uh, cable will start to loosen up just like a little, you know, just like any screw will. It'll start to loosen up. If it loosens up enough, it'll pull it off those pins and give you problems. So. What I like to do is I just like to uh, put a little Teflon tape around the threads just to keep it from uh, backing off of there, basically. And this is how the, the machine slides, or this particular assembly slides back and forth. You got two motors on there, and it's, this is where it stops. One, the, the motor that's on top uh, actually is what moves it back and forth and the motor on the side actually feeds feeds our strap through there and it has to be very precise and where the movements are and that's what it does it'll go to one spot feed go to another spot feed go to another spot and feed and that's what it does and like I said it has to be very precise because that strap is the parameters on that stuff are really really tight so you have to have a very accurate start and stop point, how fast it goes, and uh, what kind of acceleration it has. Now these are the drives. These are those cables that plugged into the motor. This is where they go. This is actually the brain. This is where you actually include your programming. You got a standard voltage going in, and then this servo drive will actually, uh, actually uh, control how much voltage and everything is. Now back there is behind that little shield right there there's a battery and that's what actually if you shut the machine off it actually keeps the program and where the machine is at when you shut it off i almost forgot to tell you the story about the borneo headhunters in november of 1944 a b24 liberator was shot down close to the philippines on the island of borneo <laughs> they were shot down, and I, I can't remember how many of them were that, that actually survived. I think it was like five or six or seven, something like that, that survived. Anyway, uh, they survived the initial crash, but they were lost in the, in the, on the island of Borneo. And they knew, all they knew about the Borneo was that people of Borneo practiced head hunting. Uh, they'd, they'd come and they'd cut off your head. And, what they would do is they would take, remove your head from your shoulders. <laughs> they'd remove your head, and then they'd take it and they, they could scrape off your face and skin and everything around the skull. they take the skull and throw it away somewhere. And uh, they had kind of like a little dummy head that was about this big around. And they usually made it out of whatever they had, mostly clay. They would bake that clay and make it hard, and they'd take that skin that had your hair and your face and everything on it and they throw it in a bowl, pot, uh, pot of boiling water and that would dry and shrink it up a little bit and then once it got it where they wanted it they'd pull it over that little dummy head and uh, that, that would be the head that they hunted. Well, 
most of them, by the time the airmen crash on the um, on the island of Borneo, most of the Borneo people, which uh, one of the groups there was called Dayaks, D-A-Y-A-K-S, and they uh, they had quit practicing head hunting for about ten or twelve years. Uh, they had kind of, I guess, grown out of it a little bit. I don't know. Well, Borneo was a uh, Japanese-controlled island. It was a military base, had a military base on it. And uh, the, uh, the Japanese controlled the island politically and militarily. But a lot of these little villages were very remote, so they really couldn't get to a lot of these little villages safely. Now, they had a good working, well, not really a good working environment, with the, uh, with the Japanese, but the Dayaks had a working relationship with them. Well, they, all, they were also very aware of the inhumanities that the um, Japanese were capable of. Were capable of doing. Um, I'm not going to go into all of that. That's that's a story for another day. But anyway, they were they were afraid of the Japanese, just like the Japanese wanted. Well, the airmen got shot down, landed in Borneo. The Japanese went to looking for them. They found two of them that were dead inside the airplane. Two two of the two Americans were dead inside the airplane. But they knew that the rest of them had gotten out and gotten somewhere. So they spent the next few months trying to find the airmen. Well, the airmen got lucky. And they fell in line with the Dayaks. Well, the Dayaks didn't like the Japanese, but they feared the Japanese. And the Dayaks had a pretty good feeling that the Japanese were getting more torturous in their, in their methods. And that that meant that they were on the way down. That they were doing anything they can to instill fear to get cooperation from people. And the Dayaks rightfully realized that the Americans were going to win the war or the uh, Allies were going to win the war. So they were kind of torn. They, they were scared to death of the Japanese, but at the same time they wanted to help the Americans. So they had people in their village arguing for both sides. You know, some of them wanted to turn them into the Japanese so maybe they could get favorable treatment. And then some of them wanted to, to, to keep them uh, to get favorable treatment when the Allies actually do win the war and come and take over the island. <clears throat> the one thing that swayed them, one way or the other, was that about 10 years, er well not even 10 years earlier, about 5 years earlier, this was 1944, so around 1939, there were some missionaries, some North American Protestant missionaries that came and converted a lot of the Dayaks and the surrounding villages and everything into Christians. Of course, it's mostly Muslim now, but back then they converted them into Christians. And they remembered how well they were treated and how they were loved by the mission uh, missionaries that were there. And uh, how well that they were treated and how well that they got along with everybody. And they were from North America and tried to teach them English, tried to lead them to Christ. And uh, they were successful in it and converting them. And that was the one thing that swayed them in favor of helping the Americans out was the fact that missionaries had come earlier and had, uh, had been so nice to them and been good to them and had been their friends. So anytime you're in church and you hear somebody talk about missions and people going on a mission and people doing missionary work and stuff, keep that in mind. There's, there's more ways that being a mission missionary can help people other than just being a mission well being a Christian mission missionary um, it, it can pay off you know dividends in other ways that's what I'm trying to say the airmen did make it off the island it's really kind of a kooky story but they did make it off the island uh, about five and a half six seven months later something like that they, uh, there was a British, uh, a British officer that had, that was on the island, and he was, 
gathering up fighters for a guerrilla warfare. And they attacked the last fort, the last stronghold in Japan, I mean, in Borneo, that the Japanese had on the, on the island of Borneo. And uh, that, was, that was enough to make a, a runway out of bamboo, believe it or not. And the, uh, the rest, some rescue planes were sent in and they rescued the Americans landing on a bamboo runway. Maybe that's something. But anyway, next time you're in church and you hear somebody talking about being a missionary and doing mission work, keep in mind that it can uh, pay off in other ways as well. Just generally being nice to somebody. Figure that out, huh?